Excellent. Excellent. Welcome, fellow directors, past presidents, members, and guests. Welcome to the 115th season of the Empire Club of Canada. And welcome to the Spoke Club. My name is Kent Emerson, and I'm the president of the Empire Club and your host for this evening. And to begin with, I'd like to begin by offering our sincere thanks to our generous sponsors. Uh, Omers and Bruce Power are our event co-sponsors. And the contributing sponsor is the Food and Consumer Prote Products of Canada, and our media sponsor is the National Post. And, well, and thank you again to MediaEvents.ca for webcasting today's event. Without sponsors like these, the Empire Club would not, it would not be possible for us to put on these events, so thank you very much. And now we're going to do a door prize for a bottle of Reposo Bosin sponsored by Cesare Fine Wines oh, of Verona. Yeah, we got our okay. Here. Awesome. Yeah, great. I made it. So I know this gentleman, Giancarlo Drennan. Come on up and get your wine. That's great. Are you mic'd up? Okay, we're going to get our last panelist mic'd up on the side, and we are. I'm going to do a little introduction here. Okay. Uh, we all know the June 7th election has radically changed the composition of the legislature. The Conservatives successfully ousted the Liberals after 15 years in power. And overnight, the province went from a, a Liberal majority under Kathleen Wynne to a Conservative majority under Doug Ford. There's been much focus on the, that fact alone. However, less focus has been placed on the degree of new blood in the legislature. 74 of 124 MPPs in the legislature are brand new. And tonight, we at the Empire Club have provided you an opportunity to get up and, clo up and close with, with these fresh faces. For those of you who have had an opportunity, either as an elected politician or as a formal po political staff, to spend some time at Queen's Park, you, like myself, I am now not so such a fresh face anymore, are going to enjoy this event tonight. Think about the moment you arrived at Queen's Park and what a steep learning curve you had at that time. Many of these panelists tonight are in that position. And my, advi my best advice to you as the panelists are um, enjoy the time you have there because you blink and it's over. It happens so fast and there's nothing like it in the whole world. So that's my advice to you. And for 115 years, the Empire Club has offered the podium to Canadians with differing views and tonight is no different. The Empire Club does not endorse the views of any political party, but endorses the spirited exchange of ideas. And with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. We got our last panelist just in time. <laughs> Round of applause for our last panelist. Butila Carpoche is the Member of Parliament uh, for the Member of Provincial Parliament for Parkdale High Park. In June 2018, Butila made history by becoming the first person of Tibetan heritage to be elected to the public office in North America. Butila is, a, the active, is active on issues around social justice and public health. She's a longtime advocate of affordable housing, workers' rights, and public health care, and an epidem epidemiologist by training. Welcome, Butila. Lindsay Park is the MPP for Durham and the Parliamentary Assistant to the Attorney General of Ontario. Before her election in June 2018, Lindsay was an experienced and successful civil litigator re representing clients around Ontario, including the Durham region. Lindsay had also worked as an advisor to the, minister, the Federal Minister of Environment. Mike Schreiner, oh sorry, welcome Lindsay. Yeah. Mike Schreiner is the MPP for Guelph and the leader of the Green Party of Ontario since 2009. Mike has led the GPO through three provincial elections. Mike is the first Green Party candidate to win a seat in the legislature in Ontario's history. He brings a proven track record in business and non-profit leadership roles to the Ontario political scene. Welcome MPP Schreiner.
Jess Spindler is a lawyer, human rights advocate, and dedicated volunteer. She is a knowledgeable public servant who has played a key role in implementing policy initiatives at Queen's Park, ranging from women's health programs to consumer protection measures. Jess was also the Ontario Liberal Party candidate in the riding of Toronto St. Paul's in the most recent provincial election. Welcome, Jess. Thank you. So tonight we're going to have a moderator who has a really great style. She, I've seen her moderate a bunch of times, Adrienne Batra. She, uh, I'm going to go have my drink and Adrienne's going to take over this whole show. It's going to be amazing. That seems reasonable. Yeah, totally reasonable. She was born in Saskatchewan. She had an undergraduate degree in political science and a master's in public administration. Ms. Batra worked at a Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan legislature as a researcher with the opposition caucus office. She then moved on the Manitoba director for the Canadian Taxpayer Federation, Canada's largest taxpayer advocacy group. In 2010, Ms. Batra was the director of communications for the Rob Ford for Mayor campaign, and moved on to serve the office of the mayor as Ford's press secretary. Upon leaving City Hall, she became the common editor and columnist for Toronto Sun and political commentator on News Talk 1010. Ms. Batra hosted her own TV show on the Sun Net Network News, focused on political, social, and economic issues. In June of 2015, Ms. Batra was appointed as the Editor-in-Chief of the Toronto Sun and 24 Hours of Toronto. She has appeared on Fox, Business News, CNN, and BBC, and is a frequent contributor on Global News and CTV News Channel. Welcome, Ms. Batra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you to the Empire Club for having us this evening. Thank you for those very kind introductions. And thank you to all of you for joining us here on this somewhat still beautiful day in uh, the great city of Toronto. Um, just a few things happening in politics these days. So a great thank you to all four of you for being here. You know, Mike, I had a very you know, clever uh, quip about you being late. You know, women are finally waiting for the man to show up. But nonetheless, you cleaned up nicely. You had some plowing to do earlier, I understand. Um, just a, a couple of sort of housekeeping items. If you want to follow along with us on, on Twitter, please hashtag on Pauly and emp at Empire slash uh, underscore club. If you uh, love what we have to say, if you hate what we have to say, please uh, let's light up Twitter tonight. Um, let's dive right in. All four of you, um, fresh faces as, as the uh, event is called tonight. Um, you know, Mike, I, I actually want to start with you. Uh, c considering what I do for a living and where I work, I was still rooting for you. <laughs> we, I was still rooting for you to be with the first Green Party MPP. Um, my, uh, it's a very easy one. Why on earth, when you had you know, a lot going on, on your own in, in the civilian life and private sector life, why would you do this to yourself? Can I say? And did you ever think you'd have to have a cot in your office? <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing, I, one thing I learned today, and I just I actually asked, asked a crowd about this, is the first time ever in my life, I changed from boots and blue jeans in the back seat of a car, <laughs> traveling 100 plus kilometers, electric vehicle, by the way, traveling over, not driving, in the back seat. And so I haven't had a chance to look up, do, do I look okay? I'm really wondering about that. Yeah. I'm in front of all these people thinking, I literally well. changed clothes in the back yeah. seat of a car. <laughs> so why did I keep doing this? Because um, I deeply believe in what we're fighting for. Right. And I feel like Ontario needs a political party that is fiscally responsible and pro-business, while at the same time is, wants to tackle climate change and protect this place that we love. Um, our farmland, our water, um, our natural spaces, and our green spaces. And I think the Green Party is proving that you can do both. And I think that voice in the legislature is critically important. And I have two uh, young daughters, and they both want to have a livable planet. And they said, Dad, you have to stop complaining about politics and do something about it. Well, that's fair. All right, I'm going to ask the que same question to all, all the rest of the three of you. Lindsay. So yeah, I, I, my background before this was uh, I was an elite level hockey player. I, I got a scholarship away to play university hockey in the U.S. and then uh, wasn't raised in a political family. But uh, when I decided to move back to Canada and go to law school, took great interest in a bunch of the public policy debates of the day. 
uh, and decided to get involved. So I, I really got a heart for public service when I was working for Peter Kent, the Honorable Peter Kent, when he was uh, Federal Minister of the Environment. Uh, and, and from that day forward, I knew I would, con would want to continue to be involved in, in some way. Uh, and it was really the state of, of Ontario, uh, Ontario's finances and the long-term consequences of that that, that, that uh, compelled me to get involved at this time. You know, Batila, you've, you've only done a few things in your life. You know, become an epidemiologist, do a PhD. Why choose politics? Well, I think uh, it really started with just my own personal life. Um, as was just mentioned in my bio, I'm Tibetan in terms of my heritage. And if you know anything about Tibetan history, uh, you know, you know that most of us have for three generations been stateless people. So I realized very, very early in my life that politics actually dictates pretty much everything in your life. And uh, as I studied uh, public health and got into that field, I saw how politics and policy are basically determining the kind of life you have. Whether you are going to have an easy life or whether you're going to have a life where at every step of the way you're going to face a challenge, it is the policies that are determined by the government. And so having that political consciousness from early age, but also being very active in a whole variety of issues. Uh, you know, when the opportunity did present itself, I thought I'm gonna step in and do the work. Jess, even though you weren't um, successful this time around, what was it that surprised you the most as being a candidate? Um, I would say, I mean, the positive aspects jump out for me. I was a first time candidate, as you say. Um, certainly it was a challenging election from the get go yeah. for the Liberals. I don't think anyone thought it was you know, an easy election to go into. So I was genuinely most surprised by the number of first time volunteers that joined our campaign because certainly you know, they weren't bandwagoning onto a popular movement at that point. Um, <laughs> you're allowed to laugh. <laughs> you could have filled their caravan, by the way, if you had been successful. <laughs> but in all seriousness, there were so many young people especially, young women especially, um, people who for the first time in their lives became active in politics and wanted to align themselves uh, with a political party. So that was pleasantly surprising to me. Uh, and it also showed me that there are a lot of people who share liberal values out there, despite the outcome of this election. Um, and so I'm you know, optimistic about the future. Um, these people are engaged. They're excited about what's next and participating in the rebuild of the party. So you know, from something negative uh, in terms of an electoral outcome, um, there is a lot of, of goodwill there um, and positive conversations to uh, keep things moving for the next time around. So we are going to get a little partisan at some point, but I want to I want to warm the I want to warm them up a little bit. They've had a busy 48 hours, actually a busy few weeks since they've taken office. Um, there is sort of a reality versus expectations when you become an elected official. Uh, Mike, you've been at this for a while. Be honest. What was your expectation? Now, what's your reality? Uh, you know. Uh, I think what you see in the headlines a lot from politicians are what you see is like the big speech or the big rally or the media interview. And I think the thing that really struck me and was my first day in my constituency office and you know, people coming to you with, you know, I need, I need child support payment or I need access to ODSP or I, you know, I need a birth certificate. Like yeah. it's just all these little things that you do that really make a difference in people's day-to-day -day lives that will never be in a headline mm -hmm. and just how rewarding that work is and you know because of the way things have worked out this summer we haven't had as much of an opportunity to do that kind of constituency work and I, I knew that work was important but I didn't realize for the avalanche of that kind of work that you have and so uh, and, but also just how rewarding that work is and so it wasn't fully expected uh, but it's certainly uh, a and a delightful part of the job. The Butila, you are a part of the official opposition now. Yes. And you know you have your critic duties, and there's responsibilities there. Um, going from the world of like academia, which is where you came from to a degree, and you know practicing, what is it that you thought was going to happen when you became a member of provincial parliament? Um, 
Uh, so actually, I also did work with uh, Sherry Genovo, who was the former MPP for Park Hill High Park. So I, even though I'm new as an MPP, I wasn't really new to the world of Queen's Park. Yeah, but it's different when you're It is very different, ballot. yes, because it's my name, my face yeah. out there. But at least I knew going in what the job looked like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the where the pressure points are and things like that. So I feel like I was quite prepared and sort of hit the ground running. Uh, but coming from a public health background, I felt that it was really, really great that I was assigned a portfolio mm -hmm. that suited my expertise, which is mental health and addictions. And you know, um, it is a very pressing issue right now in Ontario. Mental health intersects class, it intersects sex, gender, every angle. And so I think that on an issue like this, where I have the expertise, where I'm able to make a difference in people's lives, uh, it's something very exciting to, to be able to do. Jess, there, you are sitting with three individuals who have been elected now. Um, a lot of things you can learn from them, a lot of things that maybe you can change. But if you were to look in four years' time from now, um, put your name down on a ballot again, I don't know if you will, but if you choose to do that, um, what is it that you would want um, I mean, again, we, we will get a, a little bit partisan because let's let's face it, your, your premier did concede the election, so there was that. But um, for for you, for you, as a candidate, um, I, I want to ask you what what that was, you know, sort of what that's like. I mean, you, it, it takes a lot to to put your name down and to have that scrutiny and that and and, and take that personal chance. Um, what was that feeling like when you just knew and you got to that point where you're like, well, this is not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Was it worth it? Oh, it was absolutely worth it. Um, it was a, a terrific experience um, in terms of, you know, putting together a strong grassroots team in terms of getting out in the t community where mm -hmm. I grew up and hearing directly from as many people as I could. There's not many other jobs, maybe journalism is an example, but there's not many jobs where your day-to-day -day job is to be out there speaking with people, interacting with yeah. them, asking them what they care about, uh, and being open to criticism and thinking about ways that we can improve people's lives. So yeah. um, it's, it's a very special experience and one that I hope to have again. Um, I mean, when it comes to the point where the writing's on the wall, the results are in, um, it is a bit of a surreal feeling. Um, I would imagine that being successful is surreal in its own slightly different way. Um, but at that point, it's, it is a risk to put your name on the ballot, but it's, it's not really about you or any one individual. Mm -hmm. So on a personal level, I didn't feel... Um, you know, I, I felt almost an out-of-body experience, <laughs> if you will, in terms of I felt disappointment for the team around me that had worked so hard. Because, yeah. yes, it's your name on the ballot, but it is hundreds of volunteers uh, day in and day out knocking on doors. It's, you know, friends and family putting their lives on hold uh, to help out with this larger project that you are hoping will benefit, you know, a larger group of people. So from that perspective, yes, it's, it's disappointing. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, you know, you build this remarkable community of people who are very committed to a higher set of, of ideals and uh, you move forward from there and locally uh, in the riding where I ran, we're very actively doing that already. So um, from that perspective, it's about, you know, harnessing the enthusiasm from the campaign and doing um, something positive with it as we move forward. Lindsay, there was, of course, everybody was expecting that the Conservative government would, it would be a PC government, a, a Doug Ford Premier win, um, which is helpful in the local area as being a PC candidate. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. What did you find, though, um, as far as what you would talk to other MPPs, you've worked in probably, you've been in circles, in political circles for some time. Your, your reality versus your expectations now. I would say the, the biggest contrast, I, I think I knew there was lots of sacrifice involved in mm -hmm. being a, a public servant uh, and that it was a, a great time commitment that you know, would, would take away from your personal life. I, uh, I don't think I fully appreciated till I was in uh, the demands of balancing what you're doing in your riding with your responsibilities 
in, in government or down at Queen's Park. I find I'm, I'm constantly explaining uh, to people in the riding what I'm doing you know, at the Attorney General's office or, or at Queen's Park and vice versa, having to explain you know, uh, at Queen's Park why an event in the riding on Thursday night is so important and I, I need to get out to it. So I would say that, uh, that balance is uh, something I'm still, still learning and I just I think it takes a lot of uh, great communication to get it right. So Mike, you've, uh, you made history, you know, becoming the first elected Green, a member of provincial parliament in Ontario. But at the federal level, uh, your federal counterpart, Elizabeth May, she also made history by becoming the first MP. Did she ever give you any advice? Oh, yeah, Elizabeth gave me uh, lots of advice. And um, particularly, she's given me a lot of advice now that I'm a parliamentarian. Right. And you know, one of the challenges I face, and I joke about this all the time, so I was, you know, when we had our midnight sitting the other night, I was like, 100% of the Green Caucus is here. <laughs> I don't think, the, with all You're due all respect, <laughs> with all due respect to the other parties, I don't think any other party had 100% of their caucus there. Yeah. You know, today the plowing match, 100% of the Green Caucus was there today. Your attendance News record flash. is <laughs> So I think one of the biggest challenges I face is that, you know, that same balancing act, Lindsay was talking about, but try doing that with one member of your caucus, right? right? And so Elizabeth's been very helpful in terms of helping me think through how I manage that, you know, the important work we do in the House, what I do in my constituency office, and on top of that being a party leader and the responsibility the I have. I'm the critic for everything. everything. I have to have my hand on every file, yeah. right? And so that's a big challenge. And Elizabeth, as you know, has won almost every award you can, for, like hardest yeah. working, best order, you know, I mean, almost every award yeah. they hand out at in Ottawa, and so I'm hoping to bring that same work ethic to Queen's Park. And Patila, trying to be a new elected MPP, even even in the uh, Her Majesty's loyal opposition, um, you want to carve out your own thing. I mean, I know your your critic areas in mental health, um, which is such a significant part and a big big challenge in our in our province and in our country in general. How do you see yourself though, sort of emerging as a new MPP and sort of taking on something new and saying, this is what I'm going to champion. Um, beyond what my caucus colleagues are doing, or beyond even what the government is doing, to actually try to cause some effectual change? Well, I think that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you really have to make sure that you're keeping in touch with your constituents mm -hmm. and you're bringing those voices to Queen's Park. That's your job, yeah. right? And I think, interestingly, uh, I think I'm the only Toronto area MPP. So for us, um, yes, you know, we have during the day uh, our sessions at Queen's Park, but our evenings, we have the opportunity to be back in our writings every evening. Uh, so in that way, you know, uh, yes, it is still a balancing act in terms of your family and work life. But uh, I feel that it at least allows us to be part of a lot more. And in that way, our ears and eyes are on the ground. We're listening to constituents. Of course, there are many ways in which they connect with us. But for example, I haven't stopped knocking on doors since the election mm -hmm. because I continuously want to hear from my constituents how am I doing? What are your issues? What do you want me to talk about? And at the end of the day, yes, we have critic portfolios. We have other responsibilities. I'm deputy whip as well. Uh, but you want to make sure that you are first and foremost the NPP for Park to Hyde Park yeah. and you bring their voices to Queen's Park. One of the things I want to sort of note is, you know, we always talk about wanting to be representative of the future of our province. And I think this is a pretty good <laughs> indication. So, you know, credit to all of you. Um, Jess, there is, uh, you know, going to be another election in four years, we've discussed. Um, as far as your perspective, there's a lot of rebuilding the Liberal Party has to do. Um, young woman, put your name down on a ballot, took a chance. What would you say to the so-called powers that be of your own party and say, we need to get back to those roots that we had to bring us back to um, potentially running the province again? What do you, and what do you think the biggest challenges are? Well, there's certainly, you know, there are a lot of challenges. There's no, you know, easy way to put that. And there's a lot of work to do. Um, there's also a huge opportunity to rebuild from within, to get back to basics, like you say. Uh, and I think that does come from the grassroots. Uh, so I'm doing my part locally to reach out to people and see what direction they would like the party to take. Um, that involves, you know, a bit of analysis of, of what went wrong. Right. Um, to the powers that be, I would actually almost flip that question and say, you know, at the moment, that's up in the air. Um, anyone can be the future of the party. We don't need to listen, per se, to the powers that be. All bets are off. So I've had a lot of discussions with um, 
former liberal candidates, um, people who've been involved with the party for a long, long time. Um, and what we've been talking about is, you know, this is a real opportunity to change the channel, to rebrand, um, to rebuild. Uh, and I think, you know, if there's a takeaway from the last election, um, for me, it's that it does not take years and years for a party to rebuild and rebrand itself and to put a new leader out there and be very successful. We saw that very, very clearly with Doug Ford. Mm -hmm. So as much as that um, whole um, you know, maneuver came at the detriment of the Liberal Party, it does show that you don't need years of runway to make this happen if you're willing to get out there and listen and, and get back to basics. So I'm very committed to that. And as I say, I'm optimistic. We have a lot of very talented and bright people in the party who have fantastic ideas that we now have a really open forum mm -hmm. in which to discuss them. Uh, so I think there is a lot of, of great opportunity to build on that and to get back to basics, reconnect with the riding associations. We have people who've been, you know, door knocking, um, who've gathered a lot of really valuable information about what people want to see from their elected representatives and what their expectations of government are. So we have a lot to work with and we will need to sit down and, and hash that out in more detail. Um, but there are, there are plenty of people who are very excited to do that work, including myself. Lindsay, do you find it sometimes challenging? You're the only member uh, of provincial parliament on this stage that represents the government. Um, and though you may not be directly uh, in the premier's office, but you are an elected MPP under the conservative banner. Do you find it a challenge um, when things are controversial, notwithstanding what's been going on? <laughs> Come on. Good ones. I don't know. Good. <laughs> Pretty good. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, that's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> um, it must be a challenge uh, often, you know, talking to constituents or being out and about, even doing, you know, speaking to the media. You have to be representative of the government. You have to be on message. You have to be on point. You want to be consistent with what the Premier is going to say. And let's face it, sometimes that, who knows what that might be. Um, no one knows that better than I do, uh, but it is, um, it's a big task, a lot of things to juggle. How do you manage that? Well, I think uh, one, one thing I always go back to is I think through all that, it's very important to be yourself. Uh, people notice right away if you're trying to, you know, lie or make up arguments and uh, and so I think there's a balance of taking the, as much as they're, you're constricted in maybe what what suggested messaging might be on a topic, I think we still have a role as a member of the government to bring our own thoughts mm -hmm. uh, to whatever decisions being made and, and add those thoughts when we're communicating uh, to our local constituents and, and, uh, and fellow MPPs and, and members of the public. And I find, I found when I add, I, I always kind of take a decision that's being made uh, look behind the reasons for it and uh, and add my background and my thoughts into it and I find when I've add, added that to the communications uh, it's been well very well received by yeah. constituents I think constituents understand you're 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 part of a team mm -hmm. and not every decision is going to be up to you as the local MPP it's a fair question I do have a follow-up but I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that for for now um, Butila, every MPP wants to feel they have a voice. I mean, it's helpful you're the whip, so that she doesn't actually carry a whip around, for those, <laughs> which would be fun, yeah. and sometimes they need it. But that said, um, you are the whip, so that you are in a very significant, you know, stature in your caucus for a newly elected MPP. That's deputy whip. Yeah, that's deputy, deputy whip. whip. Deputy whip. Still <laughs> helpful. Um, everybody, backbenchers included, is in, especially in opposition, it's hard to. You know, make your voice heard. You want to make sure that you're effectual because you want to be able to go back to your riding and say, I've done this for you. Elect me again in four years. How does that work with your caucus? Well, actually, one of the things that I kind of expected and was pleasantly surprised to be confirmed that, you know, in our caucus, we have a lot of discussions. Mm -hmm. It is very open. Everybody is welcome to share their thoughts. Uh, for every issue, uh, we have an opportunity to give, for example, the rural angle versus the Toronto urban angle. And I find, so far at least, that there is generally, uh, you know, similarity mm -hmm. in the way we think. Because, I mean, you know, we are with the NDP because we share similar values. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really been, I think, one of the 
uh, eye-opening uh, you know, experiences where you can see how one particular issue can impact two different communities very differently, but still you can have a similar position. Yeah. Uh, and I have to give a shout out actually to my uh, colleague, Sol Mamakwa, who is the, uh, I think he's the first First Nations MPP in Ontario. Uh, he represents a Northern Riding of Kinitawung. A lot of firsts in this election. First yeah. Tibetan, first Tamil, yep. first, uh, yeah. first Nations, a lot of firsts. Yeah. A lot of millennials too. Yeah. 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 yeah, and you know, it's funny because um, he is, you know, as a First Nations person, he's always talking about charter rights and, you know, respecting uh, First Nations rights as a nation, right? So to have that perspective in our discussions around uh, Toronto City, uh, the rights of the people of Toronto, it's very interesting that you could come from very different backgrounds, mm -hmm. but still end up on the same place. So do you sit in your caucus office and just, you know, <laughs> yell at the wall or, no? <laughs> Let me tell you, managing my caucus is difficult. I can imagine. <laughs> it is but a you big know what? challenge. It, it makes, um, it makes your, your team around you just that much more important. Absolutely. Because as much as, with all due respect, to want to be in, in elected officials, you're not the smartest people in the room. Right. And you need someone mm -hmm. to sort of afford you that opportunity Bounce this idea. Should I go do this? What are the consequences that sort of work through? How does that work for you? Is it your staff? Is it, do you go talk to like your riding associates? Like, what do you do? Yeah, so I talk to a lot of people. So in the, in the, in the immediacy, it's my staff. I mean, and sometimes there are votes that come up at Queen's Park that are completely unexpected, particularly procedural votes, and mm -hmm. it's right to my staff, and I'm discussing right. it with them. On the broader issues, I do uh, consult with actually their former MPPs, believe it or not, from other parties who I consult with, who yeah. have liked me, we get along well. Um, there's obviously former officers of the legislature I've gotten to know over the years, so I consult broadly there. But in the immediacy of Queen's Park, I have to have a great staff, and they are learning as we go. Uh, I mean, this is, I'm the first, this is the first time a fourth party has been elected to the Ontario legislature since 1943. Yeah. Um, you know, Jack McLaren briefly sat <laughs> as a fourth party member in the last parliament after he was kicked out of the Conservative Party. So <laughs> even the clerk's office they don't quite know what to do with that. Right. And then even complicating it further, we have two independent parties because of the liberal mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. And so even the legislative staff, it's uncharted territory for them. So we are all learning on the go. But I'll tell you a quick story. One of my staffers I've worked with for many years the other day sent me and I said, Mike, are you mad at us? And I'm like, no, I'm not mad. I'm good. You're doing a great job. She's like, well, you just threw stuff down the other day and walked off. And I said, the bells are ringing. I'm asking you for advice. I have like one minute to get there. I said, could somebody take my folder? And nobody did. So I just threw it on the ground and walked off. And it's just because it's, but it's, it's the, um, it's that time pressure. Sure. And so I know I, I, sometimes I'm most jealous of my colleagues here who probably, you know, your caucus staff says, hey, this is how we're going to vote on this. Or, you know, you sort of plan that all out. I'm making those decisions on my own. And so the, it can be a bit stressful figuring out exactly how you're going to do that and where you want to stand on each and every vote. Well, we in the media will happily let you know how you're doing. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Let you, you can know. send me Twitter notes all, you know, along with everyone we'll else. We'll slide into your DMs, no problem. Um, Jess, there's, uh, you know, with the, the three colleagues you have on the stage here who are all, all elected, um, you know, with those in the, in the Liberal Party that, of the seven, um, the Caravan 7. Uh, Non-party status is obviously a challenge. You do not, you're not afforded the, the financial resources. You don't have the staff resources. It's, it's, it's difficult, especially going from having a minority to an overwhelming majority back to opposition. That's a hard thing to contend with. What are, or what are some of the Liberal MPPs telling you about how they're managing, um, still tr attempting to stay relevant with non-party status and still hold the Ford government accountable? Yeah, I mean, I have had conversations with a number of them, and it's it's quite different, of course, going, you know, especially from, say, a, a ministerial portfolio mm -hmm. to having much more uh, limited resources. It sounds a bit more like what, um, what Mike's describing yeah. mm -hmm. in that, you know, there's Absolutely. a small staff. There's not that kind of huge support team uh, around you. Um, but at the same time, I think in some ways it can be, you know, liberating. I don't want to put words in, in the members' mouths, but I have some experience working at Queen's Park for both a backbencher and a minister. Mm -hmm. um, so I have some exposure to, you know, the expectations of someone in that role. And we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, when you're bound to a critic position or a, a ministerial role, 
Um, there is that expectation. Of course, you're a team player. Um, you do get suggested messaging. And on certain issues, you're expected to toe the party line. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we are, as liberals, having been in power for 15 years, more attuned to having that bureaucratic support around the party and advising on issues. Um, now people need to get a lot more creative. Yes. They need to, to really get back to basics, get back to the volunteers. Mm -hmm. We have volunteers who can do this type of work, who are happy to do legal research, who are communications experts, but we do need to be reaching out more broadly and thinking more creatively about how we're gonna be responding. Yeah. Uh, so it is a challenge, but I think it's also um, an exercise that will generate a lot of, of new talent and fresh blood and, uh, and new ideas. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, we are going to open up the floor to questions in just a few moments. And just a reminder, if you want to follow us along on Twitter, it's hashtag on Polly um, at Empire underscore club if you want to tweet at us as well. Um, before we, we open up the floor, let's, let's talk about what's gone on um, over the course of the last few weeks. And Lindsay, I'm going to, I'm going to put this to you. I'm going to start it um, by what you did today in the legislature. You stood up. You're the... Or yesterday. Yeah. Oh, yesterday. Yeah. You're the parliamentary assistant to the Attorney General of Ontario, Caroline Mulroney. Um, a lot of things have been said about Ms. Mulroney over the course of the last few, few days. Some columnists, some, some people have suggested that um, she is not, not capable of doing the job without either talking to her dad or getting permission from someone uh, to, to do the things that she's doing. You gave a rigorous and th what I think quite a thoughtful defense of, of who she is and what she's accomplished. Tell me why you did that. Well, look, it's something I've just, I've noticed. Uh, I wouldn't say there was any one, uh, one thing in particular that was said over the last number of weeks that, you know, set me off. Or I think it was just, uh, a narrative I noticed that was starting to develop. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's not even a sentence in an article, but it's the whole narrative and undertone mm -hmm. of and, and framing of an article um, or framing of a question in the legislature. Look, uh, my father was a professional hockey player, and that led me to become a hockey player. So I know what it's like to be judged through uh, your father's reputation and to be connected to that in everything you do and there's a right way to frame that uh, and there's there's a wrong way to frame that and uh, and so I just I wanted to raise it I think it's important that we're all uh, both uh, in if you're a news reporter and how you're writing your articles how you're um, uh, asking questions in the legislature uh, just to be mindful of what what discourse is developing you know, Mike, uh, Margaret Thatcher once said, I particularly enjoy when my opposition goes personal because that means they have no political argument left. Mm -hmm. What is your view then on some of the stuff that has been said about the Attorney General of Ontario? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, let, I want to put this out here. and I'm on the stage with uh, four women. I actually think women in politics face more misogyny and more hate, particularly in social media, than men do. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can You're see that. away my question. Oh, right? sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, and so I think men do have it easier. I mean, we all face it. Sure. Everybody in public life, everybody in yeah. politics face it. I think women face it in particular. And I think the Attorney General, you know, obviously has been more in the spotlight recently. Um, but I do think it's fair to ask the Attorney General tough questions. Sure, For sure. Because um, she's smart. Mm -hmm. She's accomplished. You know, she's in a very important role. And so I think it's important to ask tough questions. But I don't think it's right to personally yeah. attack people. Yeah, and so what, I've, yeah, what yeah. I've been trying to do at a question period, I think even just towards the government in general, is um, ask tough questions but fair questions yeah. mm -hmm. and not attack people personally. Mm -hmm. Bettila, same question to you. Sure. We, uh, your party vociferously opposed to pretty much when the sun rises and the Ford government walks into the legislature. <laughs> we know that. We understand it. Um, well, there has been. But it, it's, it's <laughs> except for when you're sleeping in cots in your offices. Um, there's, uh, there, there, there does come a point, though, where the discourse is so sullied and so uh, inappropriate and, and, frankly, unfair. How do you, as a new parliamentarian, want to see that handled? Well, I think that uh, absolutely personal attacks doesn't help in any way. Uh, one of the things that I know we're pushing for is actually talking about issues that impact 
everyday families in Ontario. So, you know, for example, we've spent pretty much all of September talking about the not but standing clause, the Bill 5, all of the changes to the City of Toronto elections, when there are so many more pressing issues. I mean, like affordable housing crisis, we have an opioid crisis, like the list of crises is seems like never ending. So when we have so many important issues that we need to be dealing with, it is very frustrating when the government agenda is not reflecting the priorities of Ontarians. Welcome to opposition. And, <laughs> but as opposition members, it is our job to hold the government to account. Mm -hmm. And and I think that absolutely, you know, in terms of discourse, there is parliamentary decorum yep. that we need to follow in the legislature. Again, but it has to be something that all parties all members need to follow. Jess, I'm going to give you the last word before we open it up for questions. What you think of sort of the discourse and, again, uh, disagree with um, the tactics and, and what's gone on, but as far as ensuring that we have professional conversations when it comes to the future of our public policy. So my answer will be a little bit different because I'm uh, just watching this all from Twitter. <laughs> uh, I'm not, uh, I'm well rested because I'm not participating in any, you know, late night sessions. but. Uh, I have, you know, you, you can't help but notice a, a difference in, in the level of uh, the change in decorum and, and how the House interacts. And I think uh, it does, at a certain point, you know, become a distraction. Um, I mean, there are some tough issues to tackle in Ontario that I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I grew up in Toronto. I ran in a Toronto riding. I, I do have concerns with how um, this issue has been handled, mm -hmm. um, but I also have concerns that this has come to occupy so much time and energy in the legislature, uh, and it takes away from other important issues that uh, need to be looked at by all parties, um, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's you know the scaling uh, down uh, and, and end of the basic income pilot. Like We need to be coming up, and I mean we as Ontarians, not obviously as elected officials, but folks on all, uh, members of all parties uh, and across the province need to be thinking about how we're going to move the province forward. And I think that is going to require moving beyond focusing on the Ontario municipal election. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a lawyer by profession and I started to think just the other day, if, if we were to think of, of how much energy this government is putting into um, one activity, if we, if we thought about that in terms of billable hours, um, it's, it's just, it's wild. It's, it's crazy. There needs to be time and energy put into other important matters that affect more people, uh, not, not immediately impacted by this municipal election. Any hint, Lindsay, tomorrow about what the Court of Appeals going to say? <laughs> Anything? Oh, yeah, 10 a.m. We're waiting for Yes, <laughs> we'll all be waiting with bated breath. So, yeah. Mike? Do you want me to interject this really good? I, and I hope this isn't too partisan, but I think the no, Premier, I think the, I think the Premier has a responsibility to set the tone in the house. And I've been watching Queen's Park for a long time and I've never seen a premier as aggressive as this one in attacking the opposition and personally attacking people. And, and so yesterday is an, is an example. I asked a question about the notwithstanding clause and the response was um, Guelph canceled a gas or a glass plant and cost 400 jobs, and who would ever do that? And I'm thinking, like, one, it wasn't Guelph. It was a writing next door. Two, it was a city council decision. It had nothing to do with the MPP. And three, I asked about the notwithstanding clause. And, and it, that happens with, the, with I know, with the NDP and the Liberals as well. And so at some point, I think the Premier has a responsibility to defend the government's record, defend the policies of the government. I think absolutely aggressively mm -hmm. do that. But... Do it in a way and a tone that respects the House and therefore respects the people of Ontario. But you also know it's called question period, not answer period, right? I know There's that. Reason I know that. that. <laughs> uh, we're going to open up the floor uh, to some questions. There is a microphone. If anybody would like to pose a question to our new MPPs and the candidate that ran in the last election, don't be shy, no guys. Question. My question, actually, first of all, a terrific panel, a great moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think, actually, I'm quite a kind of clearly not young person. Uh, thank you all for your service. As, and uh, I'm really impressed with to see all you young people carrying on and you're <laughs> serving us well. My question is actually for the candidate that was defeated in St. Paul's 
Should things carry on the way we think they're going to tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, there will be a very nice seat in uh, Municipal Council. Would you consider running for that? Excellent question. <laughs> hey, you're going to get two days after tonight. the, after the uh, Royal Ascent. <laughs> I know the city councilor in that ward. I think a lot of people wouldn't mind him to go down to peace. <laughs> No, no, I, I'm not. I'm not announcing my candidacy in this election. I think there. We can break a, some news here tonight. <coughs> I think there have been enough, uh, you know, wrenches thrown into this one that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll sit it out uh, and and let things play out how they will. Um, but in all sincerity, I, I do hope that I have uh, an opportunity to run again in the future. Um, like we've all talked about. Um, you know, the common thread here is regardless of political affiliation, I think everyone puts their name on the ballot uh, because they truly, truly care about their communities and the future of our province. We may have, you know, a different vision of, of what it looks like to keep things moving in the right direction, but we're all interested in doing this work uh, because we do care. Uh, and I continue to care very, very deeply. Uh, so I, I hope uh, that I have the opportunity to put my name forward again in the future and in the meantime um, to help get the party back on track. I know it's been called a minivan, but I'm, I'm convinced <laughs> that the minivan is going to pick up speed. Uh, and uh, I, I plan to be there for the long haul. So thank sure. you. And uh, you can knock on doors with me uh, in the future, absolutely. Excellent answer. <laughs> Maybe it will be. I, I think we have another question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so if that won't be the news tonight, I think we do have news because the entire Green Party caucus got changed in the back of a car on the 401. <laughs> That's <system>. true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of space back there. That's not news. Um, but fresh face, uh, you know, it's a great topic, but it's really hard to be a fresh uh, face, to be a young professional or to be new in a job, new in a profession. And, uh, you know, what's kind of the, the, the tools that you've, uh, put to use or the people who you've leaned on uh, that's, that's been a source of strength, been a source of guidance, um, you know, whether it's you know, family or friends or people with experience, what's, what's that kind of lived experience been like for you that's, that's made you effective, whether it's as an MPP, but even before that as a candidate running for your, um, you know, your, your nomination, which can be an intense, intense mm -hmm. battle. I, I, think, uh, I think Jess ran against you know, somebody who was supported by the Premier's own advisors. That's right. So mm -hmm. um, it, that's a tough process, and, and what helped you get through it? The excellent question. Power of incumbency is just that, power, it is. powerful. Absolutely. So, Mike, Mike what, do you, what, do you, what would you say? Well, I'll just start by saying uh, my family is incredibly supportive. I have an amazing wife who just, um, you know, allows me to have days like today. We've hardly seen each other I think last time we really, our date night was at the GPO convention Saturday night in Barrie, you know, and I have two amazing daughters and one of them's in university now. She worked full time as a volunteer on my campaign. So for me, it really starts with family. Uh, I have a fantastic friend network of friends who have been incredibly supportive, um, both personal and professional. Uh, we have an amazing team. I mean, when the Green Party campaign slogan was people power change, and literally this party is people powered. We, we certainly don't have the financial resources of the other parties. And, um, and so that's a tremendous source of strength. I mean, we now have uh, three elected Greens in British Columbia, two in PEI, one in New Brunswick, plus Elizabeth May federally. And so we network together. Um, and so, you know, I'm always calling them for advice. They're now calling me for advice. Nobody thought we could break through in Upper Canada. And so that's been quite a significant accomplishment for us. And like I said, I have former MPPs from other parties, actually all three of the other parties who I'm friends with, who I've called on for advice. And most recently, um, the legislative staff at Queen's Park um, are incredibly supportive. I don't know if you found that as well, but the clerk's office, the library staff office, the officers of the legislature are incredibly supportive and are a tremendous resource for MPPs, especially one, you know, they, when, I, when we did the training, they said, your caucus will tell you this, your caucus will do it. And I kept going to him like, I am the caucus, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so they've been incredibly supportive. And so I just draw on all those people and I joke with people that um, be careful when you're around me because I'm a very energetic person and I suck the energy of other people and channel that into the work that I do. And Lindsay, in answering the question, you said earlier, you know, you didn't grow up in a political family, but, you know, hockey family, took a few hockey hits. Family, yeah. um, when you're talking to your friends about, oh, I'm going to go do 
this. I'm running for a nomination. Were they what? 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 Are, we don't understand your words. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think uh, when I decided to do this, certainly my family again, not not being a political background, just kind of had to uh, have faith in me, and and I think. Uh, part of that is I think what's been able to help me navigate so many life transitions from hockey to, to you know, being a, a litigation lawyer uh, and then making the transition while still practicing law to, to running for office. Um, I'm a big believer that when you have lots of advisors and mentors, there's a lot of safety in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you really can uh, learn from, from their mistakes and not have to make mistakes yourself uh, uh, first and uh, and so for me that's been a huge part of the transition and I think my friends my family all know that that's something I really value uh, and they probably find safety in that as well yeah mm -hmm. Batila yeah um, so in addition I have an almost four-year-old <laughs> and so it was quite interesting for example I put her to bed and then I head off to Queen's Park to do the midnight mm -hmm. session then after that was done, I headed back so that I could get her ready to go to school the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that is, uh, that is obviously challenging. But again, I think similar to both of them here, I had the support of my family. My partner's been fantastic. It's great that his job is not remotely political uh, just because, you know, it's such a... F you can talk about thing other things in life. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but, you know, one thing I will say is, is that... While it is great to have uh, mentors who are former MPPs and others, I think that it really, really helps to have quite a few, num actually quite a number of new MPPs, right? Because the older MPPs, I think sometimes they forget what it's, what it's right. like to be a new sure. MPP, mm -hmm. whereas your fellow MPPs who are new are going through the exact same experience mm -hmm. and trying to figure things out. Yeah. So while we are going through that, we can talk to each other and see how others have dealt with a particular issue or challenge and how we can work together. Yeah, it's like the first day of school. Where's the, where's the bathroom? Do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. One more question? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I, the only the only thing I regret about tonight is you make me feel old. The only young faces <laughs> up there. But one of the things that Tilla had said earlier was, uh, uh, although she's got many facets to her role, first and foremost, she represents the people of her riding. Mm -hmm. And um, and maybe if if you could each answer, how do you balance towing the party line with uh, actually representing what your constituents want? And there's a balance there. Um, and uh, it applies mostly to you, Jess. But if you could start, uh, Mike, if you could start. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, well, first of all, uh, I think the NMPP's first role is to represent and serve their constituents. And I've made that very clear as party leader that one of the concerns people in Guelph had was, you know, are you going to be out traveling around the province building the Green Party instead of representing us? And I've made it clear to both our members and to my constituents that my number one priority is Guelph. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I think we probably all share that. So when it comes to party discipline, I mean, I'm a bit freer, right? Like, I'm, I am the leader, and I'm only the only member of our caucus. So I'm, I'm very free to take the stand I want to take on many issues. And I know I've had some of the other MPPs come up to me in the hallways and say, oh, you're so lucky. You get to say and do what you want. And I've had a few liberals actually say to me, or former cabinet ministers saying, this is kind of freedom now. We can actually <laughs> say what we want to say. So that aspect of it is, very, is somewhat liberating. But the challenge of that, obviously, is, is you know, I have fewer people to go to, uh, particularly in caucus meetings, to talk about you know, how, how we're going to vote on certain things or whatever. So it's, it's, it's a balance. It's always a balancing act. And you know, I've approached Queen's Park as a balancing act, particularly as an opposition member, is you know, how often are you confrontational? Because one of your jobs as an opposition is to be confrontational. But you also have to look at when it, when's it appropriate to be cooperative. So I know in Guelph, Guelph is pretty much almost always voted with the government. So, you know, during Ray's years, it was NDP riding. During Harris years, it was a conservative riding. It's been liberal for the last 15 years. So Guelph really took a chance and did something different and voted green. And I know one of the concerns people in Guelph have is, well, we don't have a, a government MPP now. Are we going to get things? And so balancing that as well. And so it's just always trying to find that right balance. And I think so far I've gotten it right most of the time, but I probably won't get it right 100% of the time. Yeah, Mike doesn't have the, uh, has the luxury of just being an independent with respect to making his own choices that are best for golf. Absolutely. But Lindsay, you, 
don't necessarily have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. There are whips, there are force votes. I mean, there's confidence motions, there's confidence votes. Um, even though the other day we were all told that the motion that went forward before the legislature, Bill 31, was an, a free vote, everyone kind of knew you do represent your riding, but you also are a member of the government. And this is something that the government has decided they very much want to push. So how do you balance that? Well, one of the things I, I've said for the last year and a half on the campaign trail uh, to my constituents is I want to be Durham's representative <coughs> at Queen's Park and not Queen's Park's representative in Durham. Mm -hmm. And that, that resonates for a reason. That's what people are looking for in their representatives. Uh, at the end of the day, if uh, a bill is before the legislature and it is clearly bad for the people of Durham, I have a decision to make and my first loyalty has to be to the people that got me there, that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm representing. And, uh, you know, it, it, it can feel like an ethical dilemma uh, at times. And it's similar, I think, to I have a little bit of experience in representing people, you know, when you have clients. Um, mm -hmm. And you have duties to the court, but you also have duties to your client. And you're always having to, to balance those. And I think, uh, I think it's similar. I haven't been faced with a situation yet where, where that's been the mm -hmm. case. Uh, so I'm sure I'll have more, more, yeah. more lessons to give to sure to people a year from now. Yeah, just yesterday we saw uh, a former Liberal MP cross the floor. She felt that her government wasn't representative of the values and the principles of her riding. So she made a choice to, to cross the floor to the Conservatives. Um, it, it, it's very common. It doesn't happen a lot, but it's, it's a common principle. Um, how do you feel that um, elected officials should, should be balancing that, you know, being part of the caucus? being part of the team versus being the, the individual riding and, and being their voice. Yeah, I, I agree that if you're putting your name forward to run as a community's representative, you're doing it for that community. Mm -hmm. So I, I do appreciate that there can be these competing tensions where um, a step the government may wish to take may not be the best uh, outcome for your particular riding. And I think that's where it's incredibly important to ensure that um, people in the riding know who their representatives are, they have a good sense of how to get a hold of them, be in touch with them, um, that that person is very attuned to the needs of, of people in that community so they, that when they find there's something they can't quite agree with the government on, that they feel empowered to have that conversation before it gets to a point where yeah. someone may need to take that, you know, dramatic step. Right. Um, and I think as someone who's, you know, not elected, mm -hmm. uh, it's still very important to keep an ear to the ground on the issues that are affecting the community. Um, you know, there are, we've got a very diverse province. Um, I can't claim to appreciate the magnitude of a decision made at Queen's Park that it might have, you know, in Kenora or in Sault Ste. Marie. But that's where we need uh, strong local advocates coming together and having those uh, discussions very freely uh, inside the caucus room and around the cabinet table before a decision uh, is made by government. So as an outsider for the moment, uh, I'm doing my best to keep on top of the issues that matter to people. I think as the party moves to this rebuilding step, mm -hmm. we're going to have to have lots of, uh, you know, strong local advocates coming forward with uh, with their local concerns and we'll have to really think about how we harmonize um, those discrete local and regional issues into a comprehensive plan that we think will benefit everyone in the province. And I think that if we can do that successfully, we really can put you know, a viable Liberal Party uh, to forward uh, to present to people as an alternative. You know they're looking for a leader. <laughs> I've heard that. Really, <laughs> you might want to consider that. Could I just, but Sheila, yeah, I, I wanted okay. to. I want to say to you. I mean, sure. your deputy whip. Um, yeah, I think. So it's 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 a balance. Yeah, and I think that if your caucus is taking a position that is different from yours and in the way that it impacts your riding and your constituents, your first job is to educate your caucus members, right? Uh, so to understand, for, for them to understand where you're coming from and how it impacts you locally, but also, you know, for them to understand um, how, at the end of the day, there might be a situation that we can reach that doesn't, that can, can be a more a common place that we can land. So I think that, uh, you know, towing the party line or not towing the party line, uh, there's a lot of room in between that you can reach some place that works on both sides. I want to thank all of you for your candor, your time, and it's very precious. We all know that. 
Um, this has been a very thoughtful conversation. Many more to come, to be sure, but uh, all the best to all of you. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again to the Empire Club. And I hand it over to you, kind sir. Thank you very much. Actually, with all these MPPs here, I should put my order in. I need a, my birth certificate readjusted, and my parents have a 50. I need a certificate. Maybe you can yeah, do the certificate. Exactly. We can farm out some of my requests. Right now, uh, we're going to have the sponsor come up. Tino Evangelista is going to come up and give uh, the thank you to our panel. And then we'll just be a few more remarks after that. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Kent. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate the Empire Club putting this event on. We, I think it's our third time we've been a sponsor for an evening event. I really, really like these evening events, and we get some great panels. Uh, tonight, a bit of a double duty because it's a, almost a co-sponsorship. Since we own 50% of Bruce Power, I'd be, <laughs> it'd be remiss not to mention Bruce. And I don't know if Pat Dalzell is here. He's a director of uh, gum relations for uh, Bruce. So I want to give a plug to Bruce. It's our biggest investment provide 30% of Ontario's energy, clean, affordable, and emissions free. So hope that's good, uh, Pat, I hope you approve of that. Uh, so, uh, so on behalf of Omers, I want to say thank you very much to everybody for coming out tonight. I think these events are great. We've got a great panel. Uh, I want to thank the four members here, uh, Mike, Lindsay, Butila, and uh, Jess. Uh, I think you guys uh, did a great job, uh, especially in this uh, crazy time. You've made, uh, made time to come here tonight, and I think I can fairly say the future of politics in Ontario is very bright. So mm -hmm. I have a round of applause for everyone. And, and lastly, to Adrian, uh, she always does a great job. I think she's probably the best moderator around. And uh, I think the Empire Club should get her for every, for every panel. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks very much. That high demand, Adrian's going to have to charge us twice what she charges. Yeah. <laughs> Newspaper business is tough. This may be my future gig. This is good. <laughs> so um, there is some tremendous events coming up. But our next political event that many of you would be interested in is the Honorable Caroline Mulrooney, October 9th. It's a luncheon event. It's selling like hotcakes, so get your tickets while you can because I think it's been released for two days and there's already 250 tickets sold. So... It's going, and uh, it's coming up soon. So uh, that is on October 9th at the Arcadian Court. And thank you for your, te your attendance this evening. We try to do these events uh, and have like a time to network, a time to talk in the evening, time to, to uh, think deeply about the issues. So uh, give us, we, we'd love to know how it's going. Come and talk to us. There's a number of board members. I'd like you, all the board members here that work with the Empire Club to raise their, to stand up who are sitting just to, you know, just, I, there's Mike. I know there's a bunch of people here. I see Chris Morley, uh, who else? But Alex Badoos, but thank you everyone who's been working on this event, the evening events, Megan's here. So thank you everybody and have a great night. Yeah, thank you.